All right, we're back. Uh, we are doing a multiple part conversation with a uh, good friend, John Bradshaw, who's uh, written a number, a number of New York Times number one best selling books. He's been uh, on the uh, public broadcasting system and doing seven series. I think we've done seven series. Very successful. And, uh, but, but his new book, I think, is, uh, we were saying earlier, it took you seven years to write Reclaiming Virtue, but maybe uh, it encompasses your life way before that. Very much so. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the publishing business is hard right now, and there hasn't been a lot of promotion of the book. I mean, I'm very grateful for you to have yeah. me on, uh, but, but I am so happy that I completed this because it helped me to work through that rigid, totalistic, patriarchal mm -hmm. system that I'd grown up in. You know, and it's the Nazi system, and it's the Al-Qaeda system, and it's uh, but but it's a lot of the churches that we wouldn't want to really call totalistic systems, but they really do claim to be totalistic. You know, um, we need to be therapeutic rather than fight wars. Absolutely. I mean, un unequivocally. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and unfortunately, you know, when I, I had a hospital for 10 years and we had a lot of religious addicts, I mean, people who were destroying the life of their family and children, and it's one of the hardest things to deal with because if God is your drug, mm. wow, mm -hmm. is that hard to deal with? Yeah. And and so I, you know, I think we've got a, you've got to be more open. And you know, one of the things that I was really interesting is reading in Shakespeare with Romeo and Juliet that any virtue taken to its extreme becomes a vice. Mm -hmm. And what what a lot of these systems do is they make up this dogma that has actually maybe at one time been virtuous, but now it's, uh, it's vicious mm -hmm. and it curtails people from any kind of real spontaneity. And there are people who want this kind of certainty. Yeah. Uh, this ties into another piece in the book here. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll read this. It's very appropriate right now. Um, it was Aristotle's belief that virtue and human happiness are synonymous. And that's interesting. And I'll go on. We might come back to why can't we be happier, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's and if you're smiling at the wrong time, you're not very serious. Um, and then you go on to say, he asserted that we cannot be fully human without developing the inner strengths he called virtues. Both Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas also believed that at the pinnacle of moral life are the virtues of love and justice which transcend mere adherence to rules and laws. This keeps coming up again. Maybe, maybe we look at love now and uh, love and happiness. We're not a happy society. You don't see a lot of smiles on people. It's getting worse. And I would also maintain, and you would probably, that there's just not, a love, love, not enough love in the world. Love yeah. is the healer. Well, and, and it's love as dictated. You know, it's sort of love as a duty hmm. rather than that you allow your child, you know, you must go kiss your Aunt Millie. I remember <laughs> hating kissing my Aunt Millie. Or, the, you know, but, or, or did the aunt ever grab your face and squeeze oh, your cheek? Oh. And, and, you know, and, and you had to do it because they were your family and you had to love them. Uh, well, you can't, you can't dictate love. Uh -huh. You know, what, what we want to do is provide an environment and an example and develop people's emotions and teach them, read them good books and let them see great movies. Uh, you know, I remember in the seventh grade uh, uh, seeing the Pride of the Yankees. That baseball coach could have never told us anything that would have impacted me more than that Lou Gehrig story. Uh, stories, well, what does AA do? People walk up to the podium, they tell their story. And these stories are incredibly powerful. Yeah. In this, uh, this principle of, uh, you know, authoritarian forced obedience, uh, you're not, you know, you're, you're also supportive that children at some point need boundaries and need to Absolutely. be guided by their parents. Absolutely. But in a loving way. This is an ethic of virtue. It's uh -huh. a prudential ethic. So uh -huh. obedience is a virtue. Uh, you know, Maria Montessori, I've got a chapter in there called The uh, uh, Rediscovery of the Child. And she shows that if the environment's right, if a child's sensitive needs are being met appropriately, the brain is pruning that a child will naturally come to a state of obedience. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you have to be careful. Piaget showed that that obedience will be rigid. 
And so I have a chapter in there on conscience where I talk about the rigid obedience. You see, and if you're in a sect, or you're in a terrorist group or you're in a religious group that nobody from the outside comes in, you can get arrested at that stage of blind, almost cruel obedience. Mm -hmm. Because what should happen is that as a kid goes to school, and interacts with other kids, you have a morality now of cooperation. And then by puberty, that's when you really start questioning and you can move to ethical sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You know, Rumi says, uh, there is a field beyond right doing and wrong doing. I will meet you there. And it's the idea that there's something that moves beyond constraint and duty and, and you do it because you're a human being and you love other human beings. All right. And we're back to the love word here again. Yeah. And that's okay with me. I mean, uh, it, it would seem to me, of course, you wrote um, Creating Love, which we talked about a number of years ago, which was great. Um, let's just spend a little more time in this segment here in the next few minutes on love. Um, we don't have enough of it. It seems to be it, it's not in the John Wayne image of the patriarchy. And uh, you don't hear it spoken about a lot, particularly by uh, our, our governors. I'm talking about Congress, our administration. You know, you don't hear them talking about love a lot. Like, you know, we need to love each other more. And a as boundaries around a child, there has to be love with the, uh, you know, the authority and the rules. Absolutely. So, how, do you, how do you describe love in, in, your, in your realm of teaching and speaking? And well, I, I think there's different kinds of love. The uh -huh. Greeks talked about sorge, which was the love of a child for a parent. And there's erotic love, eros, and then there's caritas. And I mean, I think we grow in it, and it has those five colors of moral intelligence. Harm no one, don't cheat, punish, be, be loyal to those you love, uh, respect authority, uh, purity, and cleanness, I think all of those come together so that a person does its uh, a virtue is like a moral performance enhancer. Mm -hmm. It's like you, uh, in the African Queen, remember Humphrey Bogart's the old captain and uh, Catherine Hepburn, and he's drinking the, 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 the gin, and, and, and then you see this scene where all the gin bottles are floating down the, and man, it, it cut me up because I was alcoholic at the time, but she's throwing away all his <laughs> booze, and, and, he, and he says, my God, what you've done, what, what I'm doing is just human nature and she says it's human nature we're trying to overcome mr Allman. Mm -hmm. so the virtue becomes the ancients call it a second nature and then when you come like like helen fisher will talk about we weren't intended to be monogamous mm -hmm. from the point of view of evolution we want lots of dna spread it all around jump in the bushes get some more dna going uh you you gotta have virtue is what i and, and what is virtue then? What is love? It's work. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we confuse in love with love. You know, in love is this brain, I call it the PEA dopamine cocktail, mm -hmm. where, you know, oh my God, you went to high school and I went to high school. And, uh, you know, I, I know we were destined for each other. And uh, I, think, uh, I think I knew you in another life. And I say, yeah, you did. This is your mother. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> uh, uh, but we have completely made that love instead of the hard work that begins when I realize that Karen, you know, I, I tell jokes about, well, we opened the presents on Christmas Eve and we opened them fast and we didn't save the paper. Well, our family, you got to open them on Christmas morning. You got to watch while everybody, and these are celebrational rules. So once the dopamine cocktail wears off, now it's the Hatfields versus the McCoys. Yeah, yeah. And now it's work. Yeah, and yeah. now the work of love comes in. Yeah. And after a while of that, you know, uh, John Gottman found 17 studies that say you will never solve all the problems. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so you learn to compromise. You learn what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. It's patient. It's kind. It's, and, and that's hard work. Yeah, love is work. All right. And, and then and then it doesn't become work. Once exactly. you get, once you, you get all the parameters and frequencies of love, all the different kinds of love, I think then you're one with it all. Totally. All right. 
We're going to take uh, another break here, come back. We're going to do a final segment with uh, John Bradshaw. Got a surprise for you out of this book, Creating Love. We're going to go to that. I'm going to ask John to do a little surprise for you. So you stay with us for the final YouTube segment of this series.